go back nearly 50 years now, um, from the time in Oxford. Um, so I've had an acquaintance with him for a long time. However, I'm not going to reveal any um, untoward secrets at this moment. Uh, since he was doing his PhD in Oxford on seabirds, Tim has had a stellar career and been based at the University of Sheffield. He's particularly well known for his research on seabirds, especially a long-term study he's been doing into guillemots and things as well over the very long period of time now on his work extensively on sperm competition as well. As a result of all this scientific study and publication, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society, but he has more recently begun to, I think it's true, taking an increasing interest in aspects of historical ornithology. And it is on that that he is going to be speaking tonight. The wonderful Mr. Willoughby, on which he's produced both um, the book on which this talk will be based, which I've just finished reading, and I can say it's an extremely good read, and also a more scholarly and no doubt more expensive study of edited contributions about the same person. There is a lot to be said about Mr. Willoughby, and Tim is going to give us an insight into it now. Thank you. Well, I usually give this talk to um, the clubs and I start off by saying about the state of the world's birds and uh, how awful the situation is just to provide some context. And you know, we know an awful lot about birds today, but my interest in the history of ornithology has been in trying to understand how we know what we know about birds from a kind of historical perspective. And my interest started a long time ago when, oh sorry, this is some numbers here, just uh, you all know these, 44 million birds lost in the UK, 3 billion birds lost in North America, and um, we're in a pretty dire state in terms of our bird populations. But the story of, of my interest in Willoughby started when a colleague of mine's wife was writing a history of her parish, and she was going through the parish records from the 1700s, and she said, I've um, come across this list of birds that uh, the local vicar shot, and um, I wonder if you could identify some of those ones that I've had trouble identifying. And so the first one was the, the Dun Diver. There was a whole list, and most of them I could identify, but there were three that I struggled with. So the first was the Dun Diver, the second was the Chatterer, and... Uh, the third was the scallop toed sandpiper. And I, I looked around quite hard and uh, managed to identify a lot of the species. But these three were a bit more of a challenge. And then I realized I know actually where to look for this information. And where one had to look was in the book uh, referred to as the Ornithology of Francis Willoughby, written by John Ray in 1678. That was the English edition. Latin edition was two years previous to that. And sure enough, uh, the answer to those names is, is in that book. And as I say, that reading that book made me realize that lots of people uh, referred to Willoughby, uh, but very few people, as far as I could tell, ever bothered to read what Willoughby and, and Ray had said. And that led me to pose this question to myself. How do we know what we know about birds? And that formed the basis um, for this book uh, that was published in 2008 called The Wisdom of Birds. And I called it The Wisdom of Birds because in the course of my research on Willoughby and Ray, I came across um, John Ray's book, The Wisdom of God, published in 1691. And uh, this was a long time ago. I think it must have been about 2008. And I was so to find that the wisdom of God was online. It was almost one of the first books that went online. I decided to send a copy to my friend Jürgen Haffer, who was also interested uh, in the history of ornithology. What I didn't realize was that Jürgen was on a cruise uh, in the Caribbean at the time, and sending the wisdom of God to the Caribbean, it took five days to download. So it stopped the computer on the ship working for five days. <laughs> and he was uh, very gracious about it. John Ray's um, wisdom of God was a kind of much more philosophical um, examination of birds. And the crux of it was that God had uh, designed birds to fit with their environment. And Ray's science was impeccable, but instead of thinking about natural selection, which we do today, he said God 
was the answer. And in fact, John Ray's Wisdom of God was, a, was an absolute bestseller. And uh, the idea of what was called um, physico or natural theology spread across Britain and across Europe. And it helped to promote the study of birds in their natural environment. And it was because of Ray's fabulous book that I decided to call my book The Wisdom of Birds to honor John Ray's um, extraordinary contribution. John Ray was Francis Willoughby's tutor at Cambridge. Uh, Francis Willoughby came up to Cambridge when he was very young, he was about 17, and Ray instantly recognized that he was a, a young man of considerable talent. He was a ma mathematician, um, interested in, in, in natural history, and um, was just ex extremely smart, excelled in all his exams, um, and they became very close friends. At this time, Ray was uh, writing a floor of Cambridgeshire and uh, asked uh, Willoughby and a couple of other students if they'd like to tag along. And of course, during the course of those travels around the Cambridgeshire countryside, they obviously chatted about all sorts of things, which uh, helped to form an even stronger uh, bond between them. Now, when I was writing The Wisdom of Birds, um, almost nothing was known about Francis Willoughby, but a huge amount was known about John Ray, because Francis Willoughby died at the age of 36 before he'd barely got started. John Ray lived to old age and was a prolific writer, pre predominantly in botany, but his name was and still is extremely well known. And I wanted to include in my Wisdom of Birds a portrait of, of John Ray, which I got from the National Portrait Gallery. Cheeky so and has charged a huge amount for the privilege of having a copy of that. But I struggled to find a portrait of Francis Willoughby. There's this one, which is obviously copied from a, a portrait. And uh, after a lot of digging, I discovered to my amazement that the Willoughby family are still extant in North Yorkshire. And um, when I started to make inquiries about making contact with them, I was fobbed off time and time again, but I'm a very persistent sort of person, and eventually uh, got the address of Lord Middleton and wrote to him and told him what I was doing, and to my absolute amazement got a letter by return saying, be delighted to give you access to the portrait, and why don't you stay for lunch as well? I thought, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> because normally when you have to deal with the aristocracy, you're kept at arm's length, you usually have to deal with an intermediary, but this was extremely um, friendly. And um, so <clears throat> this is where they lived, Birdsell House, and uh, turned up and Lord Middleton, who was in his very late 80s, I uh, was waiting on the threshold to, to greet me, and uh, it, it, was, it was a very nice experience. And I went into the hallway where Willoughby's portrait had been, and it was high up on a wall, held in place by a very elaborate system of wires that held multiple portraits. So I could tell instantly that this had been a complete pain in the bum to get off the wall. Not only that, Lord Middleton had had a man make an easel for me. I could tell it had been made because I could smell the wood. It was just been plain. <laughs> and so uh, you know, the man put the portrait on the easel, and I got the camera out, and I kind of went click. And then I thought, I can't just take one picture. So I took about 50, making it look as though it was much more important than it really was. You know, I got one good picture. And then we went through for lunch, where I met Lady Middleton. Oh, I'll just show you the portrait. It's a beautiful portrait. Um, in this fa uh, fantastic gold frame, and Willoughby is in his 20s, uh, the book here showing his interest in scholarship and so on. And we sat down to a fine side of beef, Lord Middleton carved it, and on the uh, dining room table, the big table, there was one of those 1960s doorbells, you remember, square edge with a round button in the middle, with a braided wire held by elastoplasts across the whole of the table, disappearing into the recesses of the very large house. And at odd intervals, Lady Middleton would press this button, and you couldn't hear anything, but in due course, a servant appeared with another plate of broad beans or whatever it was. It was very quaint. And the conversation was going swimmingly well, Remember, at this time, almost nothing was known of, of Francis Willoughby. We did know an awful lot about John Ray. So I 
without giving it a second thought, said something complimentary about John Ray, and Lady Middleton erupted and wagged her finger at me and in no uncertain terms said, Willoughby was the genius, like, get this straight, Sonny. And I was completely crushed. And Lord Middleton looked at his plate, and I looked at him on the floor, and it was embarrassing. I kind of recovered the situation. But as I drove home, I went, oh, my God, of course, it should be Willoughby I'm studying, not John Ray. And so that was the um, stimulus, if you like, uh, that started this project on John Ray. And over the years, I'd had um, a number of grants from the Leverhulme Trust, um, who were a very broad-minded, interdisciplinary organization. And um, I thought, this sounds just the kind of thing that they might fund. And I looked um, at their web pages, and I saw that there was something called an International Network Grant. And I thought to myself, I bet not many people apply for that. <laughs> and you only had to have two people to be a network. Uh, I, I found about three or four, and um, I wrote the grant, and to my absolute delight, got it. And the three or four people included a, a PhD student of mine, Isabel Charmentier, who now runs the, um, the archives in the Linnaean Society in London, and her supervisor, uh, Mark Greengrass. And uh, Mark said to me, you know, once we get this going, people will just come out of the woodwork to join us. And that's exactly what happened. We ended up with 16 people in, in this network. And the way the grant worked was that um, the funding uh, would pay for us to meet twice. And we met at um, Hassett Hall in the Peak District at a very nice hotel uh, for a weekend. And everybody kind of just gave talks on the sort of things that they were interested in to do with uh, Francis Willoughby. And this is Lord Middleton's son. I think by this time uh, the original Lord Middleton had passed away. But um, his son was very keen uh, to be involved. And this was, this was the uh, group. And um, I've collaborated, as, as uh, Robert hinted, you know, with scientists all, all my life. And this was, by comparison, this was an absolute dream. I mean, there were none of those difficult people that you get among scientists. And so we, we decided what we were going to do. Uh, we decided um, how the project was going to run. And it had to run in two parts. Everybody here had to get something out of it. Hence the edited volume uh, that uh, Robert alluded to, which was eventually published by Brill and costs a mere 150 euros. But I, th I asked these people, I said, are you not worried that this book is going to be phenomenally expensive? And they didn't. As long as it's published, we don't care. <laughs> I would have cared. But the other half of the deal was that I would then write a popular account that synthesized everything and kind of uh, ironed over some of the differences in, in, in style and approach that people had used in the edited volume. And then, after, then everybody went away, and uh, we agreed to meet in, uh, I think, two years' time, come back and give talks on what they had <coughs> decided to write about. Now, initially, the grant included um, a fair amount of money for people to visit uh, libraries so they could have access to material that would relate to Willoughby. But things moved very fast, and it turned out... Uh, that Dorothy, well, I can't see her here, She's, uh, there she is, um, <coughs> was the archivist at Nottingham University Library, which is where the Lord Middleton I had met had decided to deposit the Willoughby archives. So that's where they were. And um, so talk about a stroke of luck that she was on the um, uh, group. That was, it was just fantastic. And I went there several times over the course of the project. And the Willoughby archive was basically an aircraft hangar full of papers because this family went back to the 1200s and had kept a paper record of every transaction or whatever they'd done over that entire period. So the natural history bit relating to Francis Willoughby was you know, a minor part of this. But if you were interested in land transactions, that's the place to go. But having Dorothy um, on, the, on the network, and this was uh, her husband who I met through John Krebs um, <clears throat> right at the beginning of the project, um, that was just an incredible stroke of luck. And all these people were fantastically enthusiastic. 
What I thought was going to be difficult was who was going to write what and how are the chapters. And I'd set aside four hours in the second meeting to do this. In half an hour, it was all solved. You're like, no, there's no problem, no discussion, no argument. And everybody delivered their manuscripts on time. I mean, it was the most miraculous project I've ever been involved with and the most um, stimulating and enjoyable. And our starting point, of course, was <coughs> the state of ornithology in the uh, 17th century. And it was in a pretty dire state. It was dominated by Conrad Gessner, Pierre Bellon, and Ulysses Aldrovandi. And starting in the mid-1500s, the, the style, the way you demonstrated your um, intellectual acumen and ability was to produce um, enormous volumes. This is what one of my colleagues called the era of copious knowledge. And <clears throat> when the project started, I had to go to, you know, none of this stuff was online. Um, I had to go to libraries and I used, I started off using the EGI library, that, but that became increasingly inaccessible. So I switched to the Cambridge University Zoology Library, which was fabulously accessible. All the rare books are held in a metal cage. And it's slightly disconcerting to go in there and be locked in and praying that there isn't a fire. But, you know, to have free access to this, these was fantastic. And these books are, you know, about this high and about this thick. They haven't been looked at for the previous 150 years. They're covered in dust, and you get them off, and they're very fragile. And when you open them, they are so dull. It's unbelievable. <laughs> they're, they're written in, uh, well, Latin, German, or French, none of which I can read. And if you then paid somebody to do a bit of translation for you, they are still extremely dull. There is very little natural history in there. So... Uh, <clears throat> something like Gessner or Aldermandy, they basically just had a brain dump of everything they knew about every species. So the peacock, oh, there are quite a lot of rivers called the Peacock River. So you get 10 pages of the Peacock River. Oh, there's a mountain called the Peacock. You get five pages on the Peacock Mountain. You're going through, where's the biology? There's not much biology. Some of them have got some quite nice illustrations. But the main theme running through these books is not what we would call natural history knowledge today, but mainly about making us, as recipients of that knowledge, better people. It's moralizing. So you can probably recognize this species as a pelican. I like this because this is a misery cord from um, a, a church in Suffolk. And I think it looks more like a thrush than a pelican. But this is, you've probably all seen this image of a pelican piercing its own breast to feed its young uh, in an act of self-sacrifice. And so, you know, by seeing these kind of what are called emblematic images, and you, this will happen to you, you will all become better people for having seen this uh, kind of thing. And, and these books are full of that kind of stuff. So that's the substitute for natural history. The key thing about Francis Willoughby was that when he went up to Cambridge and was tutored by John Ray was the very beginnings of, in the 1650s, the very beginnings of the scientific revolution. People were starting to feel dissatisfied with Aristotle's domination of natural history and Aristotle's uh, idea that you didn't question what he or anybody in the past had said. And the key element of the scientific revolution was to question what people said and figure things out for yourself. And the key player in all of that was Sir Thomas Brown. Um, uh, <coughs> Mythbuster, I really liked Sir Thomas Brown because he had some, just some great ideas. Here he is. There's actually a Thomas Brown Society in London at the moment. And he, you know, he had these snappy titles for the books that he wrote. And he wanted to dispel um, what were called old wives' tales. And so refuting common beliefs or vulgar errors was his kind of passion. And one of those, sorry, one of those um, vulgar errors concerned the kingfisher. And it was widespread widely believed that if you suspended a dead kingfisher from a silk thread and waited till it stopped twizzling, 
The direction in which its beak pointed was the direction in which the weather was going to come. Hardly very sophisticated. And so he said, well, okay, I'm just going to hold up two kingfishers and, oh, the uh, beaks are pointing in different directions. So in that very, very slick experiment demonstrating the stupidity of things like this, and that book, Pseudoxia Epidemica, is, is full of examples like that where he just says, you know, there's no logic to these and I can disprove them. So he was a key player, and Ray in particular was influenced by uh, Sir Thomas Brown's thinking. And as time went on, Willoughby and Ray, instead of just making these excursions into Cambridgeshire, they became uh, bolder and travelled further and made a number of excursions across Britain looking for plants and, and just chatting and trying to find out more natural history knowledge. And it was on one of those trips uh, when they were coming back from South Wales when they decided, and I would like to think that it was Francis Willoughby who decided this, uh, to overhaul the whole of natural history. Can you imagine trying to do that today? I mean, this is just such a monumental idea. I mean, and that, I think, characterizes Willoughby. You can infer quite a lot about their respective personalities from their uh, various bits of writing. They couldn't have been more different. Ray was what I call a type B. Slow, methodical, careful, his writing's all perfectly legible. Francis Willoughby is a type A. He's a man who jumps out of bed in the morning full of ideas. He scribbles them down, so scribbled that you can barely read them. And he's an absolute dynamo. So this is like the perfect marriage. Type A and type B coming together. Willoughby providing lots of the ideas, many of which, which Ray says, well, I'm not doing that because that's just too outrageous, but they stimulate each other fantastically. And I think for that reason that it was Willoughby that said, you know, let's overhaul the whole of natural history. I'm fed up with all this uh, Aldrovandi nonsense and all this emblematic stuff. Let's do some real natural history. And they agreed between themselves that Francis Willoughby would take care of the animals and uh, to quote uh, somebody who wrote this down, John Ray would take care of the vegetables or the plants. <laughs> and the key thing was that they were going to start with birds. As I say, Ray was pr principally a botanist. Uh, Willoughby probably hadn't had much uh, previous experience with birds, um, but, so that, but they decided that this is where they were going to start. So how do you go about overhauling natural history? Well, the way they did this was to travel extensively in the British Isles and collecting specimens, collecting information, talking to people that knew stuff about birds and keeping uh, copious notes about it. And it was on this trip to South Wales where they made this decision that uh, they visited um, a, a fantastic uh, guillemot colony called Elligug Stacks. It's um, on the Castle Martin uh, military range, if anybody's been there. I mean, these are just spectacular stacks coming out of the sea, completely covered in, in guillemots. And um, they interviewed local people and said, oh, tell us about these seabirds here. What do you call this, they said. And the Welsh, speaking local ornithologists, went, oh, oh, boy, oh, that's the elegog. And they went, OK, well. What's this one? Ah, that's the elegog as well. <laughs> and what's this one? Oh, that's an elegog as well. And so this fact that lots of birds of different species are often given the same name uh, was a, a key issue for Willoughby and Ray. We've got to get this sorted out. If you don't know, if you don't have unique terms and names for these uh, birds, you know, we're never going to make any progress. So part of their original aim was to start, try and standardize the naming of species. And of course, you sometimes had the same species with different names if the male and female, for example, uh, looked different. <clears throat> Ray was the first person really to come up with a decent um, definition of, of what constituted a species, but his, his names, which were in Latin, uh, to identify these were very, very cumbersome. Com you know, they were sentences compared with uh, Linnaeus's binomial system. But of course, uh, Linnaeus was deeply impressed by what Willoughby and Ray had done and actually pinched quite a lot of their um, classification without giving them any credit. 
But it's, that's a kind of measure of, of um, how good the classification was. And I think as ornithologists today, and this is true of being a historian, it's really hard to put yourself back 350 years to have any sense of what it was like trying to classify birds properly for the first time. And the nearest I can come to that, and this might offend some of you, um, is micromoths. I look at them and think, oh my god, I just couldn't face that. But that's effectively what they were faced with. Lots of birds looking very similar, warblers and waders and so on. Obviously, there were lots of distinct ones as well. But you know, people today have got their heads around this, but they're also building on 350 years of additional knowledge. But for Willoughby and Ray, it was a monumental challenge to uh, classify birds, and they did it in a very systematic way. They recognised that they needed specimens. Of course, a lot of these birds had been described by other people, but they didn't trust anybody, partly because these other people made horrendous mistakes. So they said, well, let's just start again. We'll get our own specimens of every known bird. That's a pretty tall order. And then they were going to write descriptions. And this was Willoughby's passion to produce descriptions which were very, very uh, systematic. They were descriptions of both the inside and the outside. And he started with the beak, he measured the beak, he described its shape, he opened the beak, he described the tongue, and he looked at the eyes and the iris, and then he talked about the rictal bristles, and then he worked his way down. The bird he counted the number of primaries, nobody had done that before, counted the number of tail feathers. After he'd done this external description, then he got his scalpel out and he opened it up because in those days, to have a specimen allowed you to look at both the inside and the outside. They described um, whether it had got a spleen, the shape of the heart, the shape of the gut. You know, incredibly systematic. And that was down to, to um, Willoughby. And he measured things. He measured how long the beak was or how long the legs were. Nobody had really done that before. And of course, all of that stuff is necessary because you had to have a specimen because there were no... Uh, binoculars. After their successful journeys around Britain, and they were passionate about um, seabird islands, presumably because they just saw a lot of birds at one time, uh, they started to plan a grand tour across Europe. And so this is um, it's going to be in the early 1660s. This is, grand tours had been going on for about 100 years, and there were a number of guidebooks to help you plan those tours. But they had a very specific um, uh, set of ideas. Uh, but before we come on to Europe, we'll just quickly have a look at where they went in Britain. So from the Cambridge base, they went to Bardsey Island, and then Ray on his own um, did Cornwall all the time visiting people. They must have spent every evening just writing notes because there's a huge amount of information. So the reason uh, Ray did Cornwall on his own was that poor old uh, Francis Willoughby uh, was ill and had to return back to his um, family home. So, I mean, and, Ray, and Willoughby had a number of bouts of illness during their uh, time working together. In that Welsh trip, one of the places that they didn't go to was Skomer Island here. And uh, right, right, we saw at a distance Skalme Island, which is the old name for Skomer, where wild thyme is said to grow, but we went not thither, which I just think is a lovely phrase. I'm really disappointed that they didn't go to Skomer because I've worked on Skomer for the last uh, 48 years, and uh, it's one of my favorite places. So it would have just been a nice touch had they uh, managed to get a boat there. But they did go to lots of other uh, seabird islands, including uh, the Farne Islands, this little chapel here on Inner Farne, I think it is, and we, that would have been there when Willoughby and Ray went, and they wrote about the eider ducks and the terns and uh, the puffins and so on. And then they spent a whole winter planning their European trip, and this was incredibly ambitious because lots of people went on these grand tours, but for most, and it was usually men, for most young men, this was just an excuse to have a good time, should we call it. But Willoughby and Ray's um, trip with two other uh, colleagues, Philip Skippen and uh, Francis Bacon, uh, four of them went, 
this was an educational trip like no other. The amount of, the sheer volume of stuff that they collected was phenomenal. And they'd obviously done a huge amount of preparation. They had a list of people they wanted to see, a list of universities they wanted to visit, um, people's pr um, cabinets of curiosity. Uh, this was an information gathering trip. It was also a trip in which they were collecting <coughs> specimens. Birds primarily, but everything else as well. Plants, fish, <coughs> reptiles. Um, yeah, it's just unbelievable what they achieved. One of the first places they visited shortly after they uh, crossed the channel into the Netherlands was a place called Sevenhuis, which means seven houses, a little village, um, near which there was um, uh, an extensive uh, wetland uh, that was just heaving with, with birds. And uh, this is a picture from about 100 years later that gives you some idea of what was there. And this was an extraordinary um, setup. So here's the village of Seven Hoos, and there were, by the time they got there, there were more than seven houses. It had been built up a bit. And adjacent to the village is this woodland, and then some meadows. And if you, you can't see it on the slide, but if you look at the writing, the wood and the meadows are divided up into patches of land for different bird species. This was a bird farm. There were wild birds, but they were farmed on a kind of industrial scale. There's a slight close-up here. Uh, this, is, this map was discovered after I'd um, finished the Willoughby book, which is a bit frustrating. Um, but you can see um, this is uh, spoonbills, this says um, night heron. And so these are the meadows and bits of woodland where the birds probably bred. And um, in the village, uh, the manager of the... Um, colony lived in this rather nice house. It was heavily guarded. Poaching was rife. Um, and there were uh, increasingly um, dire punishments for anybody that was caught poaching. And the crop was the nestlings of cormorant, spoonbill, grey heron, and, and, and night heron, which were sold all over the Netherlands um, for human consumption. And Oops, we lost some of this here. Uh, so, Platea with the spoonbills, Ragers with the herons, Schlopplers uh, with the cormorants and quacks. Herons and night heron chicks were extremely palatable. Cormorants not so good and spoonbills not so good, but they still harvested them. And they harvested them by going around with a, a long pole with a metal hook until they got to reach the nest and then they just shake the chicks out and then pop them on the head. But this was fantastic for Willoughby and Ray because it meant that they got some specimens. So the only specimen they ever got of a spoonbill was a nestling, a nearly fledged nestling uh, from Seven Hoos. They never got their hands on an adult specimen. So that has to form the basis for their description of this species. Um, and they also got um, some other specimens which I'll mention in a minute. Oops. Oops. Heron tricks and heron eggs. Willoughby never passed up an opportunity to gain extra knowledge. And um, at one point on their travels, somebody must, we don't know too much about this, somebody must have tipped him off about this chap, Leonard Boltner, who had produced uh, a little book, uh, it's not, not published, it was just a manuscript, of the birds of the Rhine and several of the other rivers leading into the Rhine. And as far as I can tell, Willoughby went off and met him and bought this book from Boltner. And these are some of the pictures. Boltner knew quite a, a, a well-established artist who did the, the illustrations for him. And basically, he was the manager of a forest reserve adjacent to the, the Rhine. And if he saw something interesting, basically shot it, as one did in those days, came back, wrote a description of it, and then got his um, colleague... Uh, to paint it. For Willoughby and Ray, who had only really ever seen black and white metal engravings or woodcuts, to see these Technicolor illustrations must have just been absolutely mind-boggling. And because Willoughby was wealthy, he was able to buy um, a copy of this. And that copy is now in the British Library with Willoughby's annotations on it. And then a few years ago, uh, it was discovered 
that there was a second copy that Willoughby had bought, which is in Rice University in, in North America. And I relate the story of how that was sort of figured out uh, in, in the book. But it's pretty amazing that it, um, Faulkner had made several copies and that Willoughby bought at least two, two of them. Uh, there are several other copies around. You can buy a facsimile if you've got a very deep pocket um, of one of them. Um, but this, this is very um, important for them. The other source of specimens and information were bird markets, particularly in Rome. Ray writes at one point, he said, I saw so many blackbirds and other small birds, it's hard to believe there are any left in the wild. I mean, the, you know, the Italians still eat songbirds, I think. Um, but here was you know, a fantastic array of specimens. Um, and this painting was originally attributed to uh, Caravaggio, which is highly out of character for Caravaggio. Um, but I, I wrote to, I can't remember the guy's name, I wrote that fantastic biography of Caravaggio who was on television, double barreled name, somebody help me. Graham Dixon. Graham, what's it, Dixon? Dixon. And he said, um, Andrew. Andrew, thank you. Uh, he said, no, this absolutely isn't Caravaggio. So we don't know who painted this. And anyway, this is a very sanitized view of a Roman bird market because there's no blood. Um, and everything's beautifully laid out. But it does demonstrate the range of species that people were eating. So, okay, this is quiz time now. Who can tell me what these specimens are? I thought, oh, it's a good guess. Close, but not. No. Reminds me of that dreadful program that some of you remember called Catchphrase with the Irish yeah. presenter. It's good, but it's not right. Uh, wheat ears, left with a tail feather sticking out of the bottom so you can tell what it is. And the white, they're white because they're on migration and loaded up with fat. Great delicacy. Um, but there's a huge range of species here. And Willoughby and Ray uh, are aghast that the Italians will eat starlings and other and raptors that we don't eat in Britain. And there's one live bird here. You must know why that's alive and everything else is dead. If you were a bird catcher, you had to have a live owl as your decoy. So you would tether that out in the field and then surround it with lime twigs and the birds would come down to mob the owl and get caught, or you could shoot them. So that was part of the uh, bird catcher's equipment. Now, I've indicated that Willoughby was incredibly methodical with his descriptions. So methodical that if you look at uh, their book, The Ornithology, you can find several places where Ray's a bit short with him. So, uh, Mr. Willoughby uh, was very keen on this, but I didn't think this was necessary. But it was, it really was necessary. And what Willoughby was obsessed by was something that he called distinguishing marks. What was it that allowed you to separate species A from species B? Also, what, what were the features that combined those birds in particular taxonomic groupings? And so distinguishing marks was the thing that he really felt was the, almost the most important thing. And the kind of distinguishing marks he was interested in was something like the tomial tooth, which in this instance backfired a little on him. So shrikes and uh, birds of prey like falcons have this tomial tooth, a little notch. Anybody? Know what that's used for? Breaking necks. Breaking is breaking the cervical vertebrae. And a guy called Tom Cade, who had um, free flying uh, loggerhead shrikes, did experiments where he removed the tomial tooth. So it'll grow back. He just removed it. And the birds were less efficient at killing their um, bird and m mammal prey. So because the shrike and the falcons both have this tomial tooth, um, Willoughby and Ray thought that they might be more closely related than they really are. Um, but that is an example of the sort of feature that he was interested in. And of course, in, many years later, distinguishing marks were what helped uh, Roger Torrey Peterson become the most successful field guide uh, illustrator ever. Um, not only did he use the idea of a distinguishing mark, 
he copyrighted this. So for 70 years after his death, nobody else in a field guide could use these little markers, which were key to identification. Uh, so it was a pretty canny move by Roger Tory Peterson. In amongst all these distinguishing marks, and to be fair, they're not, um, Willoughby and Ray aren't completely consistent. If you read their species accounts, some of them go through everything systematically, others miss bits out, either because uh, one or other of them forgot, or Ray forgot uh, when he was writing it. But they, overall, they do a pretty good job, and they managed to get quite a high proportion of the known species of birds as a specimen. In addition to the descriptions and the distinguishing marks, they also added um, fabulous bits of biology. Uh, so I like this bit about the quail, given that my um, main career was in, in trying to understand promiscuity in birds. The quail, the cock, has great testicles for the bigness of its body, whence we may infer that it is a salacious bird. <laughs> Fantastic. And indeed it is, you know, and it, it does have enormous testes. And the testes, the size of the testes in birds, is the best predictor of how promiscuous the females of that species are. Because if you're a male bird and you're paired up to a female and she might be promiscuous, then in order to dilute the efforts, literally, of your competitors, you need a big set of testes to produce lots of sperm. Of course, Willoughby and Ray became, came within a whisker of, of recognizing that, but today we've got a kind of behavioral ecology evolutionary framework in which we can look at these things. But I was always impressed that they kind of put two, two together here, like this is the beginning of sperm competition studies. After I'd made my slight blunder at, over dinner by saying what a genius Ray was, Lady Middleton said, I suppose you'd like to see Willoughby's seed cabinet. And I didn't really, because that's botany and I don't do botany. Well, I do, but I wasn't that bothered. And she said, well, come upstairs. And we went upstairs, and there on the landing is the seed cabinet. We now know that this is a cabinet that... Um, Willoughby had made, especially for his um, specimens. He writes to John Ray, says, I've, I've, I've had this great idea, I'm going to have this beautiful cabinet made. And Ray writes back and says, OK, make sure you've got lots of partitions because you'll have lots of different specimens and you need to keep them uh, separate. And so I staggered upstairs, no, no, Lady Middleton staggered upstairs, I followed, and she, <laughs> she got to the cabinet. And, you know, she's 90-something, and I discovered later poor lady had had several strokes. She was very frail, and, but very proud of Frances Willoughby. She opened this drawer with very shaky hands like this, and inside there were lots of seeds that were bouncing up and down. I went, yeah, yeah, okay, I've seen them, I've seen them. No more. Oh, now you've seen it. And we put, we put them in and closed the doors. Later, when we decided to do the Willoughby project, uh, one of the people on the uh, network was a botanist, and he said, oh, you've seen those seeds. Have you got any photos? I said, no, I didn't take any photos. I said, but I could go back if you want. He said, go back and get me some pictures. I need to see what the seeds are, see whether we can recognize them. So I went back, and um, <coughs> Lady Middleton was there again, and, but it was, I, I was dealing with her son, the chap who appeared in the picture down here. And um, he said, well, I'll help you. Uh, because I wanted to take the, the drawers out. And uh, so these are panels that close the doors over this bit, and then these two bits are kind of free, which is why they're a different color. And uh, he said, well, we'll start at the bottom. And he went to open the drawer, and it was locked. And I thought, well, that's, it. that's a good start. And so Lady Middleton appeared, and she said, uh, well, just get the servants in. So the servants came in one by one. Have you got the key? No, madam. Well, they all stood there like this. <laughs> right, out, next one in. Have you got the key? No, <laughs> madam. And it went on. I was like, God, this is ridiculous. I've got a train to catch. And um, after what? Oh, and then she said, oh, I, I've got a key. So she went off. And she came back. You know, you can see how big the instruction is here. She came back with a key about this big, and as she came back, I thought, that's never going to work. Of course it didn't. And eventually, a gardener came in, 
And she said, right, have you got the key? He goes, yes, it's in the bottom drawer here. <laughs> and we opened it up, and there it was. And he went off, and I was thinking, how did he know that? You know, kind of, he must have been poking around, but she didn't bat an eyelid. Anyway, we opened this up, and to my absolute amazement, it was full of bird's eggs. And I really, you know, this was one of those eureka moments in my career. I'm interested in eggs, I'm interested in history, I'm interested in birds, and it's my brain is racing. Lord Middleton's standing there going, come on, they're just eggs, and half of them are broken. I'm, I've got some work to do. I went, no, no, this is probably the most important moment of my career. <laughs> and it was, he ended up being patient. And one of the things that ran through my brain was, if you know, these eggs could have been put there a long time after Willoughby's death and might have nothing to do with Francis Willoughby, is there any chance that we can verify that they're Willoughby's eggs? And I noticed that some of the eggs have got uh, writing on them. And talk about good fortune. Here is the snipe egg. And look at this, fantastic. It's called a seraph if you're interested in uh, writing. And here's a sample of Francis Willoughby's handwriting. He does this all the time. That clinched it. So we knew that these were Francis Willoughby's eggs. It's the oldest collection of eggs known anywhere. Just absolutely fantastic. A lot of them are broken. The miracle is that they survived at all because that cabinet um, moved at least twice between different homes. And there was no padding at the, on the drawers. It's just bare wooden uh, drawers. But still, the fact that this has, had survived was absolutely uh, remarkable. So I was absolutely ecstatic. You know, my brain was racing. and was just thinking this is actually the highlight of my kind of scientific history um, career. So we, we photographed that, put it back very carefully, and then opened the next drawer. And bingo, there's another absolute surprise. And then I kind of said, did he not know that this stuff was here? And by this time, his mum had come in. And she goes, we're not curious people. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> this is just a fantastic collection of mollusks. Um, there's bits of insects. There's bits of insects here. There's some minerals up here. Uh, there's um, a skink. Any idea why, why you would have a skink? If you needed a bit of lead in your pencil, you'd put a bit of dried skink into your tea. It was an aphrodisiac. They'd obviously bought this in Italy, I think. Um, and the thing that um, really, really caught my eye was this. I've been a zoologist my entire life. I kind of fancy I can recognize most things um, without um, wishing to sound cocky. But I picked this one out, and I was just aghast. What on earth is this? What species is this? I'd never seen anything like it. And I turned it over and I went, it's, it's real. And I turned it the other way and go, it's a fake. And I, I just couldn't make up my mind. And in the end, I thought, well, I think it's real, but I've never seen anything like it. Where did it come from? Went back to my department where one of my colleagues is an entomologist and I said, okay, tell me what this is. And he went, no idea. He said, well, I'll tell you how we'll find out. We'll put it on social media, which was alien to me. And we put it on social media. And within a week, somebody goes, hmm, this is a very interesting specimen. This bit here, these are the pharyngeal jaws of a moray eel. If you've ever eaten or caught a moray eel, they have jaws in, in this part of the jaw. And this is the most elaborate fake. These, as I went back and looked a bit more carefully, these are hawthorn spines. The reason it was so convincing is that they'd used the real legs of a stag beetle attached underneath absolutely per perfectly. I said that Willoughby and Ray were writing about birds. They also did a volume on fishes. They also did a volume on insects, posthumously. And I was curious to see whether this mega beast appeared in the insect book. And it doesn't. So I think that Willoughby knew that it was a fake. And he probably bought it. I'd like to think that he bought it because he knew it was a fake. Or maybe he bought it and then figured out that it was a fake. Um, but it turns out that for all those young men doing the Grand Tour, there was an industry in making bizarre curios to sell to innocent tourists. But how much effort 
If I said to you, lot, you know, okay, I'll give you 50,000 quid, you make one like that in a few weeks. You couldn't do it. This very sophisticated uh, artistry there. Just fabulous. So they come back from the tour. They've got a suitcases full of notes. They've all written uh, detailed accounts of their travels. And as I say, you know, they must have just spent every single evening writing stuff up, copious notes. But Willoughby goes back uh, to the family home, which is near Nottingham, and Ray comes to live with him so that they can work side by side. Ray, in the meantime, um, has lost his job um, as, a, as a clergyman because he wouldn't sign the act of con con uniformity. And so that's why Willoughby said, you can come and live with me at my expense. Willoughby, in the meantime, gets married. There's a fantastic um, courtship sequence in the book where his dad's going, come on, you've got to leave an heir, you know, this is part of your duty. And his dad would go, right, I found the perfect one. To me. She's wheeled in and Francis will be with, no thanks. And go, okay, right. And then the next week there's another one, no thanks. And it goes on and on like that until finally either he's worn down or she's worn down. Uh, he chooses somebody, Emma, and uh, they get married. But within three years he's dead. So that frailty that I mentioned with those illnesses um, finally caught up with him. Even when he was an undergraduate, his tutor in Cambridge, his other tutors in Cambridge recognised that he was highly strong and very susceptible to, to stress. And poor old Francis Willoughby takes a month to die with Ray in attendance, with Emma in attendance, but very cross because Ray's used up most of Willoughby's life um, and kept him away from her. Um, there are three, three children, um, two boys and a girl. Um, but during that month, um, Willoughby says to Ray, you know, make sure my sons are educated. I'm going to give you 60 quid a year. You can stay here forever. But make sure my sons are educated. And please make sure my writings are written up. And Ray goes, don't worry, mate. I'll do it all. Very happy with that. He was happy initially. And then he wrote later to somebody else, the death of Mr. Willoughby has cast more business upon me than I would willingly have undertook. It was a monumental task to write this bird volume because they basically just had a mass of notes. But Ray, being type B, methodical, gets on and does it. But in the meantime, things go really pear-shaped for him because Emma's dad says, I forget how old she is, she's 23 or something. You can't be a widow now. You're still young and attractive. You're going to have to find a husband because you need some income. And so he finds somebody for her and she just goes along with it. And he turns out to be the biggest illegitimate so and so you can ever imagine. He's the, what was the word? I can't remember. Uh, there's, a, there's a fantastic expression that will come to me. Um, sordidly avaricious. That sums him up. And he's, he's involved with the East India Company and he does sound like a complete you-know-what. And he manages to alienate the three kids who run away from home at the age of 10 and go and live with other relatives. Poor Emma is stuck between a rock and a hard place, has to stay with him. But this guy does not like Francis Ray and kicks him out and even stops his 60 pounds allowance. He's, you know, he is a really deeply unpleasant uh, person. So Ray was, he was having to work very hard to bring this bird book to fruition. But after two or three years, there he is. He does it, and he decides to call it uh, the Ornithology of Francis Willoughby, the first edition in Latin in 1976. And then um, a, a colleague says, and how many copies of that do you think you'll sell? People yeah. don't speak much Latin these days. I suggest you write an English translation. And thank goodness he did. Because had it just been in Latin, I think Willoughby and Ray would have been lost in the mists of time. The other thing, of course, is if Ray has done the translation, he knows exactly uh, what he wants to say. And it's beautifully written. He makes a few additions. He corrects a few errors. And it's, it is a masterpiece. You can buy a facsimile. Well, you, know, you can get it online for nothing now, but who wants that? You can buy a facsimile for about 100 quid. That was the most expensive book I bought for a long time. Never told the wife. Um, and then at the end of the Willoughby Project, somebody on the panel went, this is my copy. 
5,000 quid's worth. Fantastic. You've, it's, a, it's a great book. The reason we know that, or I feel, that um, Willoughby's Ornithology would have been forgotten had Ray not made this English translation is that later on, it took much longer than he thought, Ray wrote up Willoughby's notes on fishes and produced um, uh, this massive volume on, on fish. But that was a much more difficult thing to write. There was a, a committee involved in the Royal Society helping to, to produce it. And it only stayed as a Latin copy. I paid somebody to translate bits of it, and it's like translating the telephone directory. It's just really hard to make any sense of it. And I think if Ray had written the English version of the Fishes book, it would have just been much more comprehensive. And the same is true of the insect volume that Ray didn't quite finish before he died you know, 30 years later. And the Fish one was sponsored by the Royal Society and has stunning illustrations. But it nearly broke the Royal Society's bank. It was so expensive to produce. So much so that when Isaac Newton came to want to publish Principia, the, the Royal Society said, well, we haven't got any money. <laughs> and that was because they'd spent all this money on the fish book. But it was, and it didn't sell terribly well, but people have copies of it because, just because the illustrations are fabulous. When it came to the insect one, sadly, there's no illustrations in it, and it's just a very dull uh, read. But the bird book, um, really, if you haven't seen it, just go online uh, on um, the Biodiversity Heritage Library. It's, it's a gem, and read it, because it's the text that's so good. Now, I bought this facsimile years and years before I was particularly interested in Francis Willoughby. And my facsimile copy always fell open at this particular plate. Okay, so we have a tawny owl up here, we have a night jar here, we have an alpine swift, which he calls the black martin or swift, but it's an alpine swift, and then there are three bird species from Margrave, who'd done a trip to Brazil in the 1640s. And I could never figure out what the heck was going on with this. What is that bird with two eyes? How, how could they possibly think that there was a bird with two eyes like that? And I started digging around, I thought, well, the first place to start is to go back to Margrave's original. And you can see here that Willoughby's, and Ray, well, Ray's engraver's done a pretty good job, because this is the original in Margrave's book, and um, the one in Ray's book, you know, is, is, is as good as identical. So that doesn't help at all. There it is in a bit more detail. And then I realized that Many of those illustrations in Margrave's book must have been done originally. The engravings must have been done from watercolours. And somebody said, see if you can find the original watercolours from 1640. Not, um, not a trivial challenge. And I did. And here it is. There's supposed to be a gasp of realisation. It's a little night jar with its beak open. And the second eye is the kind of passage down to the lungs. So that's what the engraver did to this beautiful little watercolour. And this collection of watercolours had the most amazing history. They were only rediscovered um, in the last 20 years. They were, I think they were part of the um, Nazi art hordes that were, were taken. I think they were discovered in Poland. And they were bought, I think, by someone like BP or one of the big oil companies. And this book with the colored pictures was produced from the originals and given as a, a gift to a bunch of dignitaries at some big dinner. It wasn't properly published. It is now, but it wasn't. So it was a very exclusive thing. And um, a friend of mine in Germany who knew Jürgen Happer knew of it and got me a copy so I could make this picture. But just uh, there's amazing convoluted stories that these um, images come from. And there's, there it is. And what it is, it's a lesser nighthawk um, from Brazil. So what did Willoughby achieve in his very short lifespan? First of all, he developed a method for studying birds, a systematic way of describing birds in, in meticulous detail. 
He made, produced the first description of, of several birds. He and Ray produced the first classification of birds that, as I say, uh, Linnaeus was very keen to, to help himself to. And Willoughby, you know, was a, he was a really lively thinker, and he said, well, I think we should be using things like song in classification as well. And Ray was a bit of a fuddy-duddy about things like that and said, no, 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 let's just stick to the anatomy, please. But Ray was, um, Willoughby was constantly trying to push at the envelope. And for me, anyway, the, the greatest um, discovery that uh, Willoughby made was to distinguish between the common buzzard and the honey buzzard, the European honey buzzard. And yeah, he's absolutely spot on about what the criteria are. There's the honey buzzard. And subsequently, Willoughby had a fish named after him, Willoughby's char, which occurs in one of the uh, lakes in the Lake District. Um, he had a bee named after him. It's one of those bees that um, eats rose leaves and, and forms a kind of um, a, a nest in a, in a hollow bit of log. And there was a whole genus of plants named after him, Willoughby I, but no bird. So at the end of the book, I suggest, knowing that it's a lost cause, I suggest we call this Willoughby's buzzard because it's called the Eurasian honey buzzard. It's not Eurasian, it spends half its life in Africa. Uh, it doesn't eat honey unless it's in captivity and you put it on its beak. And it might not even be a buzzard at all, so nobody quite knows how to classify it. But I think we should celebrate uh, Willoughby's fantastic uh, life by calling it uh, Willoughby's buzzard. And on that note, um, I'll finish. Thank you very much.